Hey y'all, you're watching Time to Connect with John Krychek, and my name is John Krychek. Hey, John Inman. Man, thank you so much for taking the time to connect. How are you doing today? Doing good. I'm doing good. I'm in my studio working on a song and uh, having a good time, and I'm really honored to be here, John. Right on. Well, I'm honored to have you for sure, man. I've been... Uh, I've been knowing about you for gosh, 50, over fifty years. I think it's hard to believe how time flies. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you're in Bastrop at your studio there. Is that right? Yep. 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 How long have you been in Bastrop? Since 1977. Wow. Okay. I guess you're pretty settled there. Well, <laughs> more or less. Yeah. yeah. What do you What do you like most about living in Bastrop? Well, uh, it's, a, it's just a regular little small town. We we actually moved out here, Kay and I uh, moved out the, out here because things were getting uh, a little bit complicated in Austin. Um, we, we Neither of us really kind of big city people. Mm -hmm. We just really uh, need a little elbow room. And we, we, uh, we lived in Elgin for a while. Then we lived out at, uh, on Lake Travis for a while, but it was... There was uh, too much commotion out there. We have a real quiet place, and that's the way we like it. I've been out on the road most of our marriage, which is 49 years now. Wow. And um, so when you're on the road, when you get off the road for a rest or something, you know, you don't need a lot of stimulation. You kind of want to chill out. And yeah. So this, this place suited us just fine. Yeah, nice. Well, man, there's so much I want to ask you about. Um, I want to hear about, um, and, um, you know, you, uh, you're a survivor. Uh, you're, are you 74? Is that right? 74. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the folks from back in the, uh, cosmic cowboys days are no longer with us. Is, is one of your secrets of longevity, uh, having that getting away from things and being in a smaller town? Yeah. It's about balance. You know, I, Hey, listen, man, I, I'm an old hippie from the 60s, and I did everything everybody else did. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And I was just crazy as a bed bug all throughout the 70s and most of the 80s. And I'm really surprised that I'm even here, frankly. Uh, but I always, you know, with uh, all the uh, craziness, I always sort of retreated into a, a quiet place when I could. And I partied, had a great time, but it wasn't all about the party for me. There, there are some people that just really, uh, they just stayed in that zone all the time. And, you know, frankly, that a lot of them created some great art and great music while in that state of mind. I've just never been able to do that. Yeah. I just have to have some kind of balance. Yeah, I'm, I'm 67 going on 68 myself. So I was I was there in the 70s and uh, I, I have the same feeling. Sometimes I wonder uh how i made it but i'm similar to you man i i did everything that everyone else did but i also craved that alone time uh it wasn't just about the party for me so hey man it's uh congratulations to you so for we're, being we're 74. kindred spirits here john we're kindred spirits yeah, amen brother amen well look uh again there's so much i want to talk to you about but let's go back and do a little biographical uh conversation to get things started here where were you born originally i guess Originally and born is kind of a redundant thing. Where were you born? <laughs> it depends on if you believe in reincarnation, I suppose. Bingo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, I, uh, I'm an army brat. Okay. And um, I was, uh, my, my uh, dad was stationed in San Antonio when I was born. I was born at Brook Army Hospital, mm -hmm. but we left when I was 16 months old and, um, we traveled all over the place, and we finally, we, uh, my dad's parents uh, uh, were from Texas. He was also an army brat, but both his parents were from uh, from Texas, and they ended up in Texas. And after all his wanderings around as an uh, army officer, medical uh, doctor in the army, he decided he wanted to be near his folks because he had been 30 years without him. And so he, he got a job, got a gig being a doctor at Scott White Hospital in Temple, Texas. And we ended up here. Okay. After living in 
know, and San Francisco and Washington, D.C. and Germany and all that kind of stuff. Army brat stuff. Yeah. So, so you more or less grew up in Temple? No, I, I didn't get to Temple until I was uh, 16, almost 17. 16. Gotcha. OK. And, uh, lived all over the place before that. Uh, we, I, we, we lived in San Francisco twice. Very unusual for an Army uh, uh, family at, at that point in time. But uh, my dad knew that hospital, Letterman Hospital, at, uh, uh, in San Francisco. So uh, he managed to get back there. And we moved to Temple from San Francisco uh, the year that the film were opened. Wow. And uh, as a 16-year-old, who know, I started playing, you know, when I was 13. I started playing in, in Heidelberg. Germany, and I was way off into it. I was just, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And um, much to the chagrin of my parents. And, uh, but when my dad got a job in uh, in Temple, I knew I was moving to Temple. I felt like I was going to prison. Yeah. As a 16 year old who wanted to play music, I was going, what the hell am I gonna do, man? But it worked out great because there were musicians I ran into and Austin was just down the road, right? And uh, it all worked out in the in the end. Yeah, I know that that feeling. I I actually my my folks lived in a suburb of Washington D.C. Um, in my high school years uh, in Falls Church, Virginia, okay. and and in my when I was seventeen, Dad moved us to Waco, Texas. <laughs> I could see yeah a parallel there yeah. And I yeah like that was seventy three for me, and I thought my God where are we but. Like you, I discovered Austin pretty quickly and mm -hmm. uh, spent a lot of time down there. Uh, so w what were you like as a kid? I was bouncing off the wall all the time. I'm pretty much ADHD and hyperactive and um, uh, pretty rebellious also. Mm -hmm. A show off, you know, mm -hmm. I was that kid. And uh, I was, you know, just basically pretty insecure because we, when we, if you're the new kid, yeah. wherever you are, um, you know, you feel a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. And um, there was, you know, there was that. And, um, uh, but, you know, I've always just been kind of silly anyway. My sense of humor just bubbles out and I can't help it gets me in trouble. It's always gotten me in trouble and I expect it'll continue to get me in trouble. <laughs> well, you, I, I will say that I enjoy your Facebook page because it's, uh, it's almost nothing but humor. And, uh, Appreciate love that. I mean, there, I, I was on a political jag for a, a long time yeah. because I feel that we're in grave danger and, um, yeah. we're in worse danger now than, than it, what we were then. But I, the, everything is so bleak out there. I feel like uh, using Facebook for, to lighten people up a little bit is a better choice. Yeah, I think that's that's an excellent choice. So do you think that you turn to music and guitar in part because uh, you're the new kid and you struggled a little bit at times? And yeah. that's a, sort of an old story. A lot of musicians start that way. Yeah, it's really true. Uh, when people come up and say, hey, my... Uh, you know, my 10-year-old son or daughter is starting to take up guitar. You know, first I joke and say, tell them to go back. It's a trap. But, uh, <laughs> but then, then I say, no, uh, it's a good companion. He will really never argue with you. Yeah. And uh, you can always go, you know, if you get the blues or get angry about something or somebody upsets you or you're sad or even if you're happy, you can go to your guitar and it's going to, talk back to you and, and give you some satisfaction yeah how old were you when john when you when you knew this was going to be your profession not just a hobby pretty much right off the bat i, I mean of course i didn't um you know when you're i i started when i was 13 and uh at that point in time um and, you know, people are trying to tell you, be this, be that, do this, do that, and all that kind of stuff. And um, it was all pretty confusing, you know. And um, I just, 
any the, the only time I was happy was when I was playing my guitar. That's a cliche, but that was really the only time I was happy. And as far as making a living going, I had even no concept of making a living. And what does that mean, too? Uh -huh. And um, I was very, you know, pretty unprepared as, as far as that goes. But as I went along, when I realized that I could I could play, and if I followed my curiosity with regard to music, there and uh, there would be something on the uh, um, uh, on the other side of it. And at the same time, while I was doing this rock and roll, you know, I started I started before the Beatles, and it was all Elvis and um, you know. The ventures, not excuse me. I'm so sorry. No, it's all right. And um, should have turned that off. Anyway, uh, it was all all Elvis and the ventures and Dwayne Eddy and yeah, all that kind of stuff. And I was and Chuck Berry was just knocked my socks off. Sure. And I had a uh, uh, I had a record by him called One Dozen Berries, which was like a uh, uh, a uh, of greatest hits. As a matter of fact. I met Chuck Berry one time, and I said, "I, I, I, uh, I met, I, I wore out one of your records," and he goes, "Just one." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so I, like I, I was just kind of soaking it all up, and rock, rock and roll was. You have to realize that uh, music before about 1955 or so was just kind of background music, you know, and it, but it became a vehicle for the expression of the baby boomers and, and this huge, huge demographic that was coming up, which I, of which I was a part. Yeah. And the music was one of the things that my generation uh, claimed as their own. It wasn't swing music. It wasn't Glenn Miller. It wasn't country. It wasn't any of that. It was rock and roll. Yeah. And um, I, I, I thought it was the greatest. I just loved it. And I wanted to be a part of it. And so as I grew as a musician, so did the so did the awareness in the in the zeitgeist of um of music and of, of rock and roll. So I just kind of it it I blossomed with it, I suppose you might say. Sure, sure. And, and then and then right a few years, I guess, before you moved to temple and really right about that time is when the beatles really hit and, and was that a pretty profound impact on yeah, you yeah. i started playing in heidelberg germany and uh, my sister's boyfriend played in a band called the furies and he taught me my first e chord and when i felt that up by my chest i went oh gosh that's that's it <laughs> and uh, we moved from heidelberg to san francisco in 1963 and the next year the Beatles yep. came and I had a little surf band playing at the team club on the Presidio there in San Francisco wow. and the Beatles came out and um it, that that it was all over after that it was just like Katie by the door I, I learned everything that I could about um, about their music and all the music that was coming out then because it was there was a it was a revolutionary time, and it happened just right in my the middle of my teenage years. Right, Could be perfect. So you must have been a relatively established, known guitar player in Austin by the time the the what, what we called it the progressive country movement in the yeah, 70s. I call it the progressive country scare. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. How, how'd you meet Jerry Jeff? What? How did that connection happen? Well, uh, it's it's. You know, I don't remember when I met him, as, as a matter of fact. It doesn't surprise me. He probably don't remember a lot about Jerry. Yeah, well, it'll it'll probably come to me. But I, I there was a group of, two or three groups of musicians mm -hmm. in uh, Austin. It, it, was a, it was a beautiful thing to see because there were a few clubs that, that did rock and roll. And the, and the bands that were in town. There were bands that came in from Dallas and Houston, but uh, to play fraternity parties and stuff like that. That was a lucrative thing. You, most of the guys and bands then would play the clubs uh, during the week and uh, uh, frat parties on the uh, on the weekend, mm -hmm. and pay was pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, 
you could uh, charge a dollar at the door and get 300 kids in there and make $300. At that and time, that was good. It was really good. I had friends that were doing better than their dads. You could buy a steak dinner for $3, you know, and rent a house for $45 a month. Yeah. And um, so, you know, there was a, it, it was, and there was all these beautiful girls in town. So it was like paradise for musicians at the time. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, these, but the thing is all these different bands and all these different musicians, they didn't really compete in a backstabbing way. Every, we all, you know, there was friendly competition, but it really was friendly and um, mm -hmm. sort of incestuous too. We'd go from one band to another and all that kind of stuff. And there was a folk club in town uh, called the, the Checker Flag, Checkered Flag. And um, uh, Jerry Jeff would come play there and, and all kinds of folk people would play there. And he kind of fell in love with Austin, and uh, he was living in. Uh, uh, as far as I, as far as I know, he was living in uh, in Florida at the time. He was he had been sort of a riding the thumb kind of guy, folk singer, right. and uh, that was his main thing was being a folk singer. But he was just real taken with the Texas thing, the um, the. Uh, the mythology of the Texan and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And he had already changed his, ma his name to Jerry Jeff Walker. Yeah. Uh, and um, he just, he liked it. So he decided, and he kind of, the, the legend is that uh, uh, he couldn't, he had to leave Florida. And um, so he thought, well, I'm going to try Austin. And so he came to Austin and Austin was just fit him like a glove because sure. there was a strong music scene. Yep. And um, he had some songs and some, uh, he had some success, uh, some records on Vanguard and stuff. And he had a manager and all that kind of stuff. So he started looking around for a band and he was, he didn't want to do a country band. He didn't want to do a folk thing. He wanted to, he had these songs like Charlie Dunn and uh, LA, a friend of his, Guy Clark wrote yep. LA Freeway and all that. Yeah. Um, but these weren't really straight country or straight folk and so and there were musicians like me and gary nunn and uh, various other people uh, uh yeah well bob came in a little bit later okay and, um uh um it was all pretty much at, around the same time but uh, I, i'll get the, I'll, the, there is some contention about the timeline okay but um we were basically rock and roll guys. Bob wasn't. He was a folk guy, and he moved into town. Bob Livingston is who we're talking about. Yes. And uh, he moved into town with uh, Michael Murphy and uh, mm -hmm. in the early 70s. But in the 60s and, and the late 60s and the first couple of years of, of the 70s, it was there were all these rock guys that had been influenced by the Beatles yep. and things, and they were writing songs. We were all writing songs and, and just... And we would go see the folk acts at, at the checkered flag and all that kind of stuff. And so I personally, and many of us didn't even see a distinction between these styles. That right. was just marketing as far as we were concerned. We was, just wanted to play. Was Doug Somm happening? Was he around then? It, well, yeah, but he wasn't around in Austin. He was in San Francisco. Gotcha. And he then was still also, up in San Francisco doing the... Then he moved out to California. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. But it was, you know, we just kind of wanted to play. And... Um, Willie moved to town and Jerry moved to town and Michael Murphy moved to town. Yeah. And, uh, they were all looking for players. Yeah. And Hey, listen, we got you, you know, cause we, we want, we didn't see a distinction between rock and country and, and folk. We just knew it was music and we liked it. Yeah. And, uh, we also liked the creative aspect of songwriting, which was really what drove that whole, uh, cosmic country uh thing that yeah, was something yeah. that was invented by uh journalists yeah sure didn't, didn't have you know it was just a way to sell this stuff sure. but the down in the trenches where the musicians were uh -huh. they just they just looked at good songs right it was really all about the songs and not about the styles and and speaking of that uh john one of my obsessions is is bob dylan has been since i was a a little oh, yeah. kid and yeah. I, I never really hear him 
mention much when thinking about that that time in the early 70s when rock and roll and 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 the cowboys and the and and the country music all kind of came together in that confluence in Austin but but yeah uh, lyrics became important i know songwriting became important so surely dylan had some influence in all that yeah dylan had a great deal of influence on the individual musicians but uh uh it was you know uh, how could he not right you know? Right. You know, I mean, he was like, a, and he he was in a in a, a cat and remains a category in a category of his own. Right. And so, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, he's just out there by himself, and and um, everybody that I know looked up to Dylan as a as a creative force. Yeah. And uh, just being, you know, you looked up cool in the dictionary and you saw Dylan's face. Yeah. What do you do? You, you maybe you don't even try, but it. I think about sometimes young people today who they might come to Dylan and they they're not going to have a clue. They're not going to understand uh, mm -hmm. because they weren't there. Do you have you ever tried to make an attempt to a younger person who says, "Oh, I don't that guy sucks. He's terrible. I don't understand why everybody likes him." Do you even try to make an attempt to explain no. why? No, I've never ha I've never had the opportunity to do it. Yeah. Uh, if I uh, if I did, I'd say, "Well, you have to." have to realize the context in which he came up yeah and uh you know the that and it's the same with the beatles yes or the rolling stones or any of the stuff that happened in in that in the mid 60s it was a very bizarre and strange and frightening time yep. and uh there was so much going on and um the context is is everything you yes. know historical context uh you don't think of, well, in my parents' generation, they had swing music and they had jazz music. And those things were associated with the Depression and World War II. Yep. And, you know, rock and roll and pops, what became pop music and whatever, all the permutations of it, all the different offshoots of these forms, um, they came right out of their env their environment just like the yes. the old bands did and so it's really really hard to uh to to separate the context from the from the uh from the music from the art yeah and um you know the, the, those kids that uh that and i don't blame them saying well that guy sucks man he can't even sing his guitar's out of tune what's yeah. up with this yeah and um but you know, somebody like me could listen to uh, some of their, you know, the hip hop stuff and all that and go, well, I kind of prefer a melody, actually. <laughs> and, you know, that sort of thing. It's It has to do with the context. And yeah, hip hop yeah. came up out of, out of social right. uh, uh, stuff in, in Brooklyn in, yeah. in late 70s and early 80s. Sure. You know, and, um, you know, Taylor Swift, she's she's got her own thing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it has to do with her generation. I, I kind of want to say to people, it's though, Swift, Taylor, like, Taylor Swift would not exist without Bob Dylan. Well, I, that's exactly right. And she I think she would be the first to admit that. Right, right. And, but it's um, you just oh, I don't I don't know how to how to put this, but you 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 can't separate the, uh, uh, you know, the the history. Right. And the, the culture. Yeah. out of which the music came and the music yeah you're right yeah absolutely well man you have played with an incredible list of people um uh, i will put show notes uh to a company i can't keep a job apparently pardon me <laughs> apparently i can't keep a job <laughs> did did you play with i think you played with towns at one time is that true yeah as a matter of fact yeah i um not not very much live i did a good gig live with i was just talking to somebody day before yesterday about that um with uh towns in a place called la zona rosa sure. but i actually um recorded i think something over 50 between 50 and 60 songs of his songs in the late 80s um there was a um, uh, a company that was buying people's uh, catalogs or licensing people's catalogs and releasing their entire catalog, but it, it had to be re-recorded. And uh, the producer contacted me and some other people and uh, 
I think it was 1987, and over three or four months, we recorded a whole bunch of stuff. It was an amazing experience for me because I would look over there. He was just like four or five feet away from me, and it was like recording with Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I really looked up to the guy, but I was afraid of him because he had come around. He and Jerry Jeff would get into trouble together, mm -hmm. pretty bad trouble sometimes. Mm -hmm. and um it scared me you know but he uh when i did these sessions i kind of walked in and eh, let's, let's see and uh, but he had just gotten out of rehab and he was just a sweetheart oh, good. and very patient with the with the producer um the producer had uh uh divided his material up into three styles one was a, a, a mexican or a latin style and another was blues and another was folk and he had different uh, rhythm sections. Uh, for instance, the blues, they, he, he hired uh, Fats Domino's rhythm section. Wow. And the, uh, the Latin, uh, it was uh, Doug, Sam, and Augie Myers, Ernie Durawa, uh, yeah. Ruben Ramos, Freddie Fender. They were all in the studio together. Wow. And, I, was, and I, I got to be the guitar player on most of these things, the electric guitar player, mostly because I could kind of interpret the producer's desires um, because he had this eccentric way of communicating. He was from New York City, and some of these musicians, uh, uh, you know, like we would, uh, we would, we'd do the song, and um, Towns would nail it, the band would nail it, and it would sound really good, and the producer would want to do it over and over and over again. And um, it, it wasn't really good people skills with the musicians. I ended up being sort of a a translator for the guy mm. and it turned you know most of it turned out good you know and although uh, i'll never know because it's still in litigation wow only only 10 i think 10 or 12 of those songs came out as a cassette called texas rain wow. if you find it it's worth a lot if you can find it oh. um and it, it, i've heard it once and it sounded pretty good you know uh, yeah it was it was really an honor to be associated in that way. I'm sure, but, I'm sure. And you you play besides Jerry Jeff and Towns, Ray Wiley, Delbert McClinton, B.W. Stevenson, Jimmy LaFay, Michael Martin Murphy, Eliza Gilgitson, Jimmy Yell Gilmore, Steve Fromholtz. The list goes on and on and on. Um, who is someone that you didn't get a chance to play with? I have to correct that. I didn't. I did not play with B.W. I oh, I you didn't the same show with B.W. several times. Okay. Uh, I didn't I never played in his band? No. Okay. But the list is yeah not complete. There's a lot more than that. And who's mm -hmm. someone that you never played with that you wish you would have had the chance to play with? Oh, golly, uh, Dylan, I think would be yeah. top of yeah. the list. Yeah. John Prine, did you ever have oh, any? Oh, God, I would love to have played with John Prine. Yeah. Yeah, that would have been yeah. great. Steve Earle. Yes. Well, yeah. By the time Steve. I have a story, a Steve Earle story. Oh, good. Um, by the time Steve Earle kind of started making it, as they say, yeah, um, I was, I was, you know, off doing other things, and and I was, I think I was playing with, uh, with Delbert, uh, but anyway, a, a number of different things, and and he was a, he was sort of ensconced in the Nashville thing yeah. and that's you know at that point in time austin and nashville were sort of separated yeah um guy was in nashville guy was in nashville yeah and uh, the story i have to tell is is uh has guy in it and um uh, we were we uh, with jerry jeff in the 70s we went up and we recorded three of uh, uh, of his records uh at quadraphonic uh, uh quadra quadraphonic uh, studios in uh in nashville and used uh, some session musicians there kind of the a-team guys and i got to play on that stuff as well and of course there was a lot of silliness going on a lot of partying and all that kind of stuff and one of the things we used to like to do and jerry loved to do this everybody loved it was late at night we'd all have a, in a hotel room somewhere have a picking session you know mm -hmm. and have a bunch of beer and wine and whatever and um trade songs and we were doing that one time and and guy showed up with this kid uh with a beat up old cowboy hat and uh he was maybe 19 years old or something like that 
And uh, he just proceeded to blow everybody away with these incredibly well-written songs and cogent lyrics and all that kind of stuff for a guy of 19. Yeah. And um, just blew everybody's mind. And I just, you know, we moved on and all that kind of stuff. But years later, many years later, I ran into uh, um, I ran into a guy at a gig up in Oklahoma City, and I <laughs> the guy was kind of a curmudgeon. He was kind of a grumpy guy. Yeah. And um, he, I, you know, I said, "Hey, guy, you remember that time in that hotel room you brought that kid in from San Antonio? You know, he just blew us all away." And he interrupted me. He went, "Steve Earl." It was Steve Earl. I thought, I said, I thought so. Yeah. I thought that was Steve Earl. You know, but time time flies. I'm I'm getting ready to host. Actually, when this episode goes live, is about the time I'm hosting a, a Steve Earl 69th birthday celebration at Cherrywood Coffee House in Austin. And I've got a bunch of players coming to to play Steve Earl songs for oh, good for you, man. That's cool. hours and to honor That's him. Good. And man, what a catalog. He's just amazing. He's an amazing writer. Yeah. Born to write. What's a what's a uh, what's a show that you played? I know you played so many, uh, and it's kind of an unfair question. But what comes to mind if you said one of the most memorable shows you've ever played? <laughs> memorable for what reason? Well, there you go. You know, uh, we got streaked at Carnegie Hall one time. What's that? We got streaked at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> in well, that, that was memorable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pretty, pretty memorable. Yeah. And yeah. we did a couple of gigs at uh, at Carnegie Hall, which we, I thought was absurd. And so did the people that worked at Carnegie Hall, by the way. Was that with Jerry Jeff? Yeah, Jeff. And we did also uh, uh, Jerry uh, on the same bill was uh, Doug Song, you know. Ah, okay. And uh, we had a good time playing and all that stuff. But uh, Jerry had some crazy friends, you know, and one of the girls just took off her clothes and came out on stage and. And it, it was, you know, streaking was a thing. Yes, it was. It was. And so, yeah. uh, we, that, that, so that was memorable. I have to say that was memorable. I, I imagine, yeah. Memorable shows you attended. Some A show that just you, you went to that just really sticks in your memory. You know, that's a hard one for me because I started working so young. All my weekends... Where I'll, you know, I hardly ever go see shows. I've hardly ever gone to see shows. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And, um, uh, and to be honest with you, many times, the, the only few times that I've seen shows, I've been kind of disappointed in, in, the, in the sound, in the way it's mixed. Gotcha. Yeah. Because it's like all drums. And I was going, oh, my God, if that's the way we sound, I don't even want to know. Well, I know you're you're also a jazz and a blues fan. Any jazz artists or blues artists that you got to see that? Well, I I I um, I, I did a stint I, I, with um, uh, with Delbert. Mm -hmm. Dang, got it! I need to turn that thing off. Um, okay, man. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I did. Uh, where was I? Uh, Delbert, you did a stint with Delbert. Yeah, we did a whole tour with uh, a summer tour with Huey Lewis and the News. Okay. At big stadiums in, uh, this would have been 1987, 86, 80, 88 or 89. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, um, uh, Huey was huge, you know, and sure. uh, it's like we're playing to 40,000 people. Yeah, yeah. And so that was memorable. And these guys were really great. They were so such nice mm -hmm. guys in that band. Mm -hmm. and stuff but uh, they uh it was very odd they had two separate pas one for uh delbert and the opening act and one for themselves and i had to, i roomed with the uh the sound guy and I, I asked him what is that all about and uh he and he was complaining because a guy uh the road manager for huey would come around with a db meter to his board and wouldn't let him go above a certain db uh. And I said, what is that all about? And he says, well, he's keeping us down to 105 dB, but at 111, everybody starts to move. And so there was a governor on the, on the, uh, on the accelerator of the opening act. And so that, you know, 
they didn't need to do that, but they did it. Now, it's done all the time, from what I understand, or was done. I don't have any idea how they do it these days. Everything's all all dancing and yeah. chorus yeah. girls and all that kind of stuff these it's, days. So I don't. It's such a production. Right now. back then, it was all about the the, the songs and and yeah. the way they played. You know. Yeah. Uh, it's not so much these days, from what I understand. But yeah. I don't go see shows. So I'm no judge. What do sure. I? Know? Sure. Sure. So one of the, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, uh, I was looking at your Facebook page. You and I have a lot of mutual friends in common, but you know, when you say Facebook friends, you don't know if it's really friends or not. I <laughs> notice I noticed Gary Mortensen is a friend of yours on Facebook. Are you a friend of Gary's? I know of him, but I, I you know that Do, Dobro player there in in uh, in Bastrop. No, but I'd like to. I there are times when I really need a, a Dobro player. Man, he is amazing. He's amazing. He he actually, I'll send you, a, I'll send you a link. Uh, he he's played on a couple of my songs, and uh, he every time I played with him, I, he just blows me away. One of the finest well, musicians I've ever played with. Know, I'd like right to have his contact up. information because I have. You got uh, it. That every now and then. You got it. The other one that I wanted to ask you about, and actually, this wasn't a Facebook friend, but going thinking about the seventies and. Kerrville and and people like like C. Fromholtz, who I I hung out with a little bit myself in the seventies. Do you remember the D. Muller band? Oh yeah, sure yeah. Did. did you by any chance know her bass player Doug Cedarholm? I I didn't know his last name, but I I you know in passing I I knew his name was Doug. I've been trying to find Doug for years. He were he and I were we met at North Texas in Denton when we were both freshmen. And we played a bunch of music together. We hung out a lot. He ended up playing bass for D, and um, and I lost track of him over the years. I'm not sure he's still with us, but I've been trying to find him, and I can't. You know, you know, if anybody knows that I know, it would be Freddie Kirch, and I'll ask him. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I'll I'll circle back with you on that one. Yeah, uh, uh, text me his his full name. So you got it. I'm terrible with names. I mean, I can't. You got write. it. Yeah, when I when I uh, connect you with Gary, I'll I'll do that. So, how about your? I know I definitely want to talk about your studio. I know you won Producer of the Year at the Texas Music Awards uh, back uh, about eight or nine years ago, and I know you're busy in your studio these days, recording a lot of singer songwriters. Is that a lot of the that, things? That's all that I do. I okay. I have just this little tiny studio that uh, um, I, I don't even cut drums. I just it's singer songwriter. It's a boutique, excuse me, a boutique studio, uh -huh. and I specialize in songs and songwriters. So you know, how, how would it work if I came in, for example, I probably can't afford you, but if I came in and... Uh, I bet you can. <laughs> with, with eight or nine songs of mine, uh, and we wanted to record them, what what would that look like? How What do you do with guys like me? Well, okay. I This is exactly what I do. This is what keeps my refrigerator running, especially, uh, particularly... Uh, since uh, COVID wiped out most of the uh, the venues that I used to play. And also, you know, I'm 74. Who's going to hire a 74-year-old guy? Oh, a lot of people, but... Well, anyway, uh, I I like to work in the studio. I, 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 I would like to look, work live more. But anyway, people will uh, approach me and I'll say, well, one, send me an MP3 of just you and a guitar or come by my house. Uh, and you know, play some songs, mm -hmm. and I will have them. Uh, uh, you know, you you let me know which songs you want. We'll do it one song at a time, and you just play it, and I'll I'll find a tempo and a feel, and, and build the whole track. I I program a uh, an amazing amazing drum program called Superior Drummer that I've had engineers they can't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. um and um i mean it's it's pretty incredible anyway so i program drums and i play all the instruments except the ones that i can't play which i i'll play a little bit of keyboards and i'll kind of fake a dobro that's why i would like to have an actual dobro player it would be nice mm -hmm. and you know fiddle or really good piano playing i i can farm all that out and horns i've, I've got access to some good horn players and uh just build the track right here and I bring people in one or two at a time and, and build them. And I, I, I really, I like to work really fast. I can, if somebody comes in to my, like if you came in and said, I've got a song that's, uh, I really want to record it. And I, um, 
I, if you came in like about 10, 30 or 11, you would walk out at three with a, a, a full uh, a full record. I mean, a full cut uh, from, you know, soup to nuts. Definitely. I'll, I'll be, I'll be reaching out to you about that for sure. That yeah, sounds fantastic. Easy. So, so you're not playing out much these days? Not that much. I'm doing some stuff with the so-called Gonzo Compadres, which was an offshoot of the Los Gonzo band. They, we were, it was me, it's me, Freddie Kirch and Bob Livingston. It's a trio. And we were, we worked with Jerry Jeff more than anybody, any other musicians did because uh, particularly me and Bob, because we worked in the seventies with him. And then we worked in the eighties with him and all throughout the nineties with him. Of course, these were kind of off and on things, but mostly it was us. And Freddie was in the, in the eighties and the nineties. Uh, Freddie actually was in the, the band that replaced uh, the Los Gonzo band after we quit. And um, uh, it was called the Bandito Band. They were good, really good musicians. And but Freddie uh, was Jerry Jeff's favorite drummer, and uh, and one of his favorite people because Freddie's a hilarious person, and uh, just really cool to hang out with. And um, so we, the the Gonzo Compadres were named. Uh, by uh, Jerry Jeff in the 90s because they had to have a name because they were we recorded uh, several records in the 90s with him but we had been his band basically in the 80s 90s 80s and 90s 70s 80s and 90s uh, if there were big shows and this was a road band I mean this there was a four-piece band and uh, we were the roadies and uh, we just you know rented amplifiers and backline wherever we went and we were on the road like 250, 280 day, 280 days a year. And um, uh, if there was a big show, like a TV show or a big concert at, uh, or there's some shows that we did in, on each Christmas night um, at Billy Bob's uh, Texas, and we would he would hire a keyboard player and a steel player. And um, but otherwise, when we we're out on the on the road, you know, in the uh, in the hinterlands, it was just a four piece band. And uh, so, uh, Freddie, uh, this last year, this uh, earlier this year, uh, was in contact with uh, the owners of the Birchmere, uh, one of our favorite places to play in Alexandria, Virginia, right across the Potomac from uh, Washington D.C. We played there a million times. Recorded a record called Night After Night there. Uh, you know, live record. And so Freddie stayed in touch with those people and they, they called him and said, hey, uh, would you like to play Mother's Mother's Day night and call it Redneck Mother's Day? And so he, he said, let me get our, let me get these Gonzo compadres together and see. So we did that earlier this year and out of that grew a couple other gigs. So I, we've been doing that a little bit. That I think maybe we've done, I don't know, four or five gigs this year. But you know, it's a side hustle for everybody, all of us, all three sure. of us. Yeah, and so it's fun, and and people seem to be interested in it. Um, nice, nice. There's that, but that's that's pretty much what I mean. I'm going to play with a guy this Friday in Austin uh, named Bill Oliver, who is uh, he's been a uh, uh, he's a uh, environmental troubadour. Mm -hmm. He, he, uh, I, I met him way back in the seventies when there, everybody was protesting the no nukes and mm -hmm. Bill is like a hero. I mean, he has uh, been part of the Barton Springs, uh, uh, protecting Barton Springs for 40, 45 years now. Okay. And every year plays this gig, um, uh, to raise uh, money and consciousness for Barton Springs. It's a war of attrition because of the, the corporate, uh, encroachment sure. of sure. the government. Here in here in Austin, where's but, the gig? Uh, the gig is actually at the American Legion Hall uh, in Austin. Happens okay. every, nearly every year. Of course, COVID put a big hole in all that. But sure. um, I, I so I play with him whenever I can because he he plays for good causes. And I went down and played in uh, Bandera this last weekend. Nice. Um, another charity cause. Um, to raise money for Wheels on Meals on Wheels and this uh, uh, incredible uh, thing they've got going down there for old folks. 
Uh, so I, I don't get me started because it's a very, very huge, complicated thing. But it was we did three shows in three different venues in Bandera and uh, raised a, a bunch of money for that. Great. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm actually doing a thing this weekend for uh, Toys for Tots. Um, it's, you know, it's good. To, it's good to be able to do what you love, play music and do it for a good cause, for sure. Right. Right. Exactly. John, listen, man. Uh, I want to wind down here. I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor. I've got a couple more questions for you, though, yeah, but, but before I let you mine. go. Um, so one of the things that interests me, I, I was looking at your your online presence, and I know I don't even know if you remember that you have a quote from Lincoln on your Facebook page. Yes, yeah, so I put that on there. Most people are as happy as they make their minds up to be. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to just ask you to expand on that a little bit and maybe I wanted to challenge you about it a little bit, but, but go ahead. And, and if you will, just why does that quote All right. okay. what resonates with you? I am prepared for this question. Good, good, good. Um, happiness is a choice. It's not something that just happens to you. It can, I mean, you can be happy with your circumstances, um, you know, as they just kind of fall to you, but there, there's a lot of, uh, um, uh, suffering in the world and and you, you get born into the world you're you're going to have some of that and some people have more than others and some people don't but for me um uh it's uh and uh, it's where you put your attention Att attention is th the most potent thing that you've got and your attention where you put your attention actually will grow and if you put your attention on unhappy things, you will become unhappy. If you are unhappy and you try to put your attention on something that's a little happier, you will become happy. And it's I've tested this out and I will test it out later on today, I'm sure. But uh, uh, it's, it is a fact. And um, also it's when you, you know, being happy there is is there's a a spectrum, you know that's a popular, you know, mindset these days. But there is a happiness spectrum, as there is a sadness spectrum. Sure. And if you can you can kind of stay sort of in the center of it, uh, with a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And if you just look, you know, if you just don't give in to whatever suffering you're tempted to indulge in. You have a choice. It is a choice. And so uh, sometimes it just takes you and you're going to be bummed out and you're going to be bummed out for a while. And that's going to create your, end, you know, stimulate your endocrine system into pumping chemicals in, into your body that will make it last a little longer and stuff. But you can tap that down if you can be conscious enough to say, okay, I'm not having fun here. What can I think about and what can I do that will make me have some fun? Yeah. And so, I mean, that's, I mean, that, you know, having a, a, a life in music and as a professional musician, it kind of prepares you and trains you for that because that's your job yeah. is your, your job is to take people out of their troubles. Yeah. And in the, in the meantime, you know, you get taken out of your troubles as well. Yeah. And so you really learn this le lesson pretty potently, unless you rely on your blues and your depression to create. And there are many people that they, they can't create unless they're really bummed out. Yeah. And I'm so sorry for them, but it has made some great art, I have to say. You bet, you bet. Is it a coincidence or is it um, is there a direct connection that a lot of what you have just been saying, I would put under the category of, of at least, if not spiritual, philosophical Buddhism? It is philosophical. It, it's both. It's it's definitely spiritual. I mean, my spiritual life is, is I don't talk about it a lot. Uh, but it's it's front and center. And uh, when you think about uh, what music is, um, it's not it is a spiritual endeavor. And, and you can't prove that that you really do it uh, uh, by volition. Mm -hmm. It is done through you if you're doing it properly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you have to do the work to have muscle memory to be able to. Sure. And stuff, but I defy anybody to to play a a, a series of thirty second notes, and and say that I did each of those notes deliberately because yeah. that's yeah, a, you know what, and because um, 
people don't know that they're actually in, uh, uh, music casts a spell and they don't know even the audience doesn't know that they've been taken to another state of mind and if that's not spiritual, I don't know what is. Amen. And and I'm not a great guitar player. I couldn't I couldn't do what you do. But I I write songs. Uh, um, I've been sort of an armchair poet most of my life, and love poetry, love to write lyrics, and love to write songs. And the best ones, it really does feel like it's given to you. You, it's a you get out of the way and let it happen. It's exactly how art works. And, and the, any of the songwriters in, in, uh, in Nashville, which is, you know, that's where the gold standard in songwriting is, they say, uh, is they, um, they write a, a thousand songs. They just write, it's a numbers game. But every 99, 999th song is the one, you know. Yep. That, yep. It, Towns told me one time, he's, you know, the... Uh, his song uh, about a card game, something in Mr. Mud. Yeah, Mr. Gold and Mr. Mud, I think. Like yeah, that. he and it's it's a whole card game. It's right. a complicated song, lyrically, and he said that he wrote it in about thirty minutes. And he said it felt like it was coming in the top of my head and coming down my arm. And he, he just he just he channeled the lyrics to that song. Yeah. And I, th I think that happens more than some people realize. And I, th and I think Dylan did that as well. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And he, he would even say it. He didn't say it in quite those words. There's a famous interview with um, uh, on 60 Minutes of Dylan. And with Ed Bradley. With Ed Bradley. Just, uh, and he would say, oh, man, I can't write songs like that anymore. Right. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. I don't know how I did it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But he was, you know, I'm, I'm sure that he was, uh, you know, altered in some ways. But at the same time, that can open up a portal. And, um, you know, who knows where art comes from? Right, right. It's, yeah. it's, it's a spiritual endeavor, no matter what you do, whether you're, whether you're dancing or, yeah. or painting or whatever. Yeah. You know? yeah, that's beautiful, man. I sort of want to leave it there, but I, I, I'm, but I'm compelled to just make ask you one more question or really just make another comment which is mm -hmm. uh you know the the happiness thing one of the things that i do in my professional life is i i'm an executive coach and it really comes down to therapy and and the way i look at it is i'm trying to help people be happier yeah I'm my little bit to help people be happier and man people struggle people struggle and i and i really think they struggle more today than they ever have yeah. And I think there's a lot of reasons you you nailed it when you talked about your attention. Most people cannot control their attention much at all. And the culture is teaching us to be distracted and and to lose our That's ability it. to pay attention. So right. um, and and there's also a lot of research right now that tells us we probably have less free will than we thought we had. Uh, but no that. but we have the ability to shape our own minds. Yes. And, yes. and, and, and it's absolutely what you said, which is where you place your attention. And one place you place your attention besides music is on your wife, Kay. That's right. <laughs> you, you have, you said something like everything you do is for your wife, Kay. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. That's a beautiful thing, man. I think that's one of the reasons you, you're a, you, you're a survivor. You're, you're clearly happy. You, you've had a good life. And um, yeah, there's no doubt be, about it. I, I would be pushing up daisies if it weren't for her. Yeah. Uh, I was just as that's beautiful. I was, I was completely messed up when we met. I was, I was so, uh, I was a sick puppy, and um, it took took her a few years to straighten me out. <laughs> uh, but I'm really grateful for it. And but I was, uh, I was not a, I was not a, in my opinion, I was not a good human being back then. Well, you are now, and it's been a pleasure and an honor to talk to you john inman and uh, thank you so much for taking this time to connect if you will hold on just a little bit as we uh as we end this because i want to ask you a couple questions offline but uh sure. hey man thank you so much for doing this i really enjoyed this and really good questions and um i i i'm honored to be a part of this yeah thank you so much man take care bye-bye